God's presence. Talked him into Come I had to move this Catherine so I could look at you. <laughs> we talked him into coming back to Arkansas to intern with Simmons first while he was beginning to transition to what he's doing now, both in law school and Clinton School, public service. <clears throat> You know, when Bert came to us as an intern, little did he realize with Stevens we were getting ready to do an equity offering. So, you know, we didn't pay Bert very much money. I told him interns don't make much money. <laughs> and he worked about 16 hours a day. And at the end of all that, he just thanked us for the opportunity. That's, that's the kind of bird, man Bird is, and he has become a great friend as his dad has. And, uh, I thank you, Bert, for those kind remarks. Skip Rother. All I can say about Skip is he's a great friend. Obviously, he's a super businessman. He not only elected or had a lot to do with electing a president, but in doing so, he laid the foundation of making sure we got the library back here in central Arkansas. Nobody could have done it like Skip. I recall when Dr. Sugg told me that our inaugural dean of the school Clinton School was uh, Senator Pryor. And he told me that Senator Pryor was going to retire and he had to make a selection. And he said there was only one person in the United States that could do that. And he just hoped that he would accept it. And he said that was Skip Rutherford. And I would tell you that's Tremendous compliment coming from Dr. Sub. Last thing I would tell you is that while Skip is at great at virtually everything he does, he's not much fun to watch a football game with. <laughs> I said, I never know where Skip is. He's either outside trying to get some pressure off of him or he's chewing his fingers. Somebody said, fingernail. I said, no fingers. <laughs> I looked over one time, Skip had his head down. He said, what happened? I had my head between my legs. He said, I don't know. <laughs> so we made good, good partners. But Skip's an outstanding friend and gentleman. There's one other person here that I want to mention. And uh, that's... Dr. Al Babon. Where is Al? Al is a professor here and an outstanding gentleman. But how I really got to know, here's Al back here. 
how I really got to know Al is through his son, Robert, who's played football with my grandson, uh, Jackson, the nine-year-old, both obviously all Americans. <laughs> but uh, Robert was very important to the team. I asked Jackson one time, I said, Jackson, now this is nine-year-old Phil going to the championship of the flag football. And I said, this is important. I said, what plays y'all going to call? And he said, well, we're going to have Robert right and Robert left. <laughs> and that's what they did, and they were the champions. <laughs> well, before getting too far in my, my presentation, I must apologize for my voice. Uh, I recently had surgery. Now, little did I realize when I had that surgery that the timing was going to be as it was, and it was suggested that maybe I record this. Modern technology could do wonders with it, but I told them, no, I wanted to, I wanted to be here for this one. This surgery is called diaphragm pacing, which doesn't mean anything to you, but it's a, all about breathing, and I tell you what, it wasn't much doubt in my mind that I was going to have it done when I could, and so we did, and this uh, same surgery was uh, done by a doctor, uh, Dr. Anders, who performed. Phil, I knew you could do something good. Thank you. Phil and I competed for quarterback for 25 years in high school. We were there for a long time. <laughs> this, uh, this same surgery was done on Christopher Reeves. And Coach Adams, that's pretty tall cotton. I felt pretty good. And uh, most of you will remember Christopher Reeves as Superman. And, uh, you know, we have a lot in common. <laughs> we were both somewhere around approximately 6'5 or so, and we were both bulked up, good looking. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit of exaggeration. I think I'm more like 6'2. <laughs> While we had different diseases, we did have in common this, this breathing challenge. And uh, I was told that, you know, by the doctor, that I was in the same prep room, same operating room, same recovery room as Superman. Right, Captain? doctor said it only seemed fitting that I would be called the bionic man. <laughs> so that's what I'm claiming. But because of this surgery, I may not speak as fast or as loud as normal. So you may have to listen slow and carefully. But as you will learn in my presentation, I, I do have a what we would call a rare disease, and I have a special friend here somewhere, Dr. Stacy Renicki. I don't know where she is, but right. Oh, oh my God. Well, I got to be nice. Dr. Renicki is a specialist in ALS at UAMS, and only in Arkansas would this happen. Dr. Renicki and a friend of mine, Bo Busby, who's a cardiovascular surgeon, went to Cleveland with us and scrubbed and was actually in surgery as it was going on. So I said, only in Arkansas would that, that happen. 
One cautionary note for those in here that are athletes, like me. Dr. Renicki is a huge, huge Notre Dame fan. And I promise you, she knows a whole lot about football coach Adams. You probably want to visit with him later. We've taken her to three or four Razorback games. And Alan, Dr. Bobbick, I can tell you that she can call the hogs with the best of them. And she can tailgate as long as there's plenty of Diet Cokes. <laughs> well, I, I want each of you to truly know how proud I am to be here today. And based on my be brief review of your many previous speakers, I'm way out of my league, and I promise I'm not being humble, but I am cheap. <laughs> you know, I, under I understand you have had presentations from all walks, <laughs> ranging from our Secretary of State, former governor, ambassadors, athletes, and movie stars. And I usually, this time, talk about how I was one of the greatest unrecognized quarterback, but I got in this front row here a whole bunch of my friends that would play football and one of my coaches, so I can't lie. <laughs> so I'll just move on and Say what you ended up with is an Arkansas banker nearing retirement, just out of surgery, can't hardly talk, upset about the Razorback basketball game. <laughs> I came from a free lunch, found out that we're brown back. <laughs> so, Best of luck to all of you. In all seriousness, I'm again honored to be here to share life's lessons. And while my presentation could be considered my personal testimony, and it is, I, I want you to know that it truly is a uh, story of how you know life's lessons prepare us, you and and me uh, for the, the good and the bad that each of us will ultimately face in our lifetime. And this is so important for the students that are here. That's a story about the maturation process that does take place, even though sometimes we wonder when. It's all about when we eliminate the personal pronoun I and focus on we. Uh, it truly is a story about uh, why we all want to be successful and make lots of money and maybe have a little fame. And I can tell you, I was in, in that category of wanting that. The real fun the true real fun starts when we find ways to get involved, to help others, help themselves. And that is exactly why I so wanted to be here today. Because the students here are preparing themselves for the ultimate sacrifice. Each one of these students, and I've had the opportunity to meet many of them through Skip. I promise you, Wayne, each could go to New York, Los Angeles, London, and become a part of a major corporate franchise 
And some will at some point, but instead they've chosen to prepare themselves for a greater calling. And that is what it's truly all about, helping others help themselves. Now, while we live in a, a world where there's hunger, starvation, repression, and great need, we're blessed to live in a nation where there's prosperity, freedoms, and opportunities. But even in the United States, there are many people in our country, in our great state of Arkansas, and in the cities that, that we live that have tremendous needs. And I'm thankful to live in America, and I am thankful for our soldiers that sacrifice so that we and the rest of the world can have the freedoms that we enjoy. Three months ago, we celebrated Thanksgiving. Uh, unfortunately, I, like most of you, sometimes forget about how much we had to be thankful for. We live in a country that gives us the freedoms that others simply dream of. We're free to say what we think. We have the ability to vote and elect those that will help make our laws. And despite our many challenges, and we, we all have them, we're still one of the most prosperous societies on earth. We can protest without fear of retribution. While expensive, we have the best health care in the world. And last but not least, we have the freedom to worship where, when, and how we please. We are truly a society of plenty. But I think you would agree that we often forget to be thankful. Too often we simply take things for granted. Uh, sometimes we forget to be thankful until we see others without, and then we're reminded. Sometimes we would prefer not to talk about those needs. Instead, we would rather think someone else is going to make it better. Well, that's exactly exactly why the students at the Clinton School of Public Service are so special. That they are going to help make it better. Well, they do represent individuals who are preparing to be a part of that process. And you know, the mission of this school is to educate and prepare individuals for public service, incorporating a strategic vision and an authentic voice and a commitment to common good. Now, while the school has a unique curriculum, it also is unique for its emphasis on leadership, for social change, preparing students to become leaders in the public, private and nonprofit sectors. I'd like to say that things don't just happen. People make them happen. And each of our journeys through life will present us with some opportunities to watch or to be difference makers. And sometimes our journey may also present us with some challenges which make things very complicated. Sometimes we forget the power of our faith until we have a crisis. And then sometimes it 
takes a journey of experience to help us get things in perspective. So now let me tell you a little more about my journey. And today I, I hope to share some of the events in my life that I call defining moments. And each of you either have had them or you, you will have them. My journey covers over 65 years, obviously thankful for you. Time's not going to let me elaborate on all 65, but maybe only 50 years because my dad, who was pretty tough, Chad, you'll remember that, ultra-conservative, I came about it naturally. He said the first 15 years, I didn't know anything. So there's no, we only need to talk about 50 of those years. <laughs> but during that time, we had lots of challenges and opportunities over that 50 years. And my topic also involves the strength of my faith. And while I am a Christian, I realize that some of you are from different parts of the world and represent many different cultures and many different religions. And regardless of our cultural, social, religious, religious or ethnic background, we, we do have one common denominator. We're all human and regardless of our background, it truly is the lessons that we, you and me, learned from our mothers, our fathers and our grandparents and friends that have prepared us for this world that we live in. It is the strength of my faith that enables me, Catherine, and family to deal with what I like to refer to Dr. Radinke as my medical challenge. Now, while this is my journey, it's really not about me. You'll find some commonality either now or someday in the future. You know, Webster defines journey as a travel of passage, travel or passage from one place to another, from childhood to adolescence uh, to maturity, hopefully. Took me a long time. A journey is like a long trip. Every one of you been on vacations. You know where you're going. You know how you're going to get there. But Angelus never works that way. You always have some bumps in the road, detours. Sometimes you have to choose alternate routes. Well, life is uncertain and has many twists and turns. At best, life is fragile. Life is a, a journey. And we often come to crossroads in our journey in which decisions must be made. I like to refer to it as a fork in the road. While Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, we know it. it's really not that simple, especially during times of crisis. I like to say that some of the decisions that we make in life, again, are defining moments. They are literally life-changing events. Most people will find you have two, three, or four in a lifetime, and each of these defining moments is what enables us to mature, uh, to love, to hurt, 
and yes, to, to be thankful. Now, I believe that God uses events in our lives that prepare us for these challenges that we're going to face, especially during a crisis. And I'm convinced that he uses you and me to help others through their crisis. Uh, he gives us opportunities when we least expect them. Sometimes prefer they had not come up. And he, but he wants us to help others, to help others help themselves and to serve him. I'm going to refer to a little scripture, if you don't mind. Romans 12, 7 through 8 says, Anyone who has the gift of serving should serve. Anyone who has the gift of teaching should teach. Whoever has the gift of encouraging others should encourage. Whoever has the gift of giving to others should give freely. Anyone who has the gift of being a leader should try hard when he or she leads. And whoever has the gift of showing mercy to others should do so with joy. In other words, God fully expects us to use our talents to help others, help themselves. No, we simply need to follow in the footsteps of two of my good friends, Bill Clark and Paul Eels. Each use their talents and resources to help others, and they did it for all the right reasons. Very seldom did you know about it. You know, each of you do that every day in your service, to your community, to your church, and to your business. But you know, there is more we can do. First Corinthians says that each of us has a unique gift. Now, I've got to tell you, I've had some challenges trying to figure out what my unique gift might be. And I knew it was there, you know, I just needed to ask the Lord and prepare myself to, to follow that guidance. But you know, it's easier said than done. I genuinely believe that my journey over the last several years has prepared me to stand before you today. My journey definitely has had many twists and turns and as an adolescent, if trouble was to be found, I found it. These people know it. I hope you don't believe it. <laughs> I finished high school thanks to the fact that my high school coach's wife, Coach Gregory, Mrs. Gregory, taught lots of cat courses. She helped me graduate. I was definitely not a scholar. But it was high school where I had my first and most important defining moment, thanks to an unexpected encounter with Bill Glass. Some of you will remember a all-pro defensive end with the Cleveland Browns, who was an evangelist at a revival some of the members of our football team attended. And it was there that I committed myself to Christ and while I've had many occasions to slip, uh, he never let go, and boy, I'm, I'm thankful. I continued sowing my wild oats uh, through the next several years, next couple of years of college. Then my dad, this very conservative, pretty tough, man told me when I came home second year of school that summer that he wanted to help me understand 
there were certain consequences to one's actions. Doc Suck, back then, they sent the report cards directly to the family. <laughs> hey, that was a bad thing back then. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to take you out, out of school, and I'm going to get you a job, and we're going to see if we can not get on the same page. So he did, having me laying saltwater pipeline in the woods of South Arkansas, where the mosquitoes are as big as sparrows. <laughs> you know, I, I decided that after two months that this was not for me, that I, I just go out and find my own job. And I told, told him I would. He said, get after it. So I did. I, I showed him. I joined the Marine Corps, promptly went to Vietnam. <laughs> my second defining moment, truly the greatest maturing process I could ever have achieved and not fun. I would not necessarily recommend it to others, but most effective for me at that time in my life. After returning to college, I married, graduated from college. I got a job in New Orleans because two of us applied for it. The other guy turned it down. <laughs> Had children in my birth. I mean, in my journey over the next several years was very exciting, eventful, and really maturing. And even so, God was working on me about what was really important in life. Church, family, work. Unfortunately, while I had the right priorities, I had the order in the wrong sequence. Next several years of my journey, were a bit bumpier on several crossroads. I changed jobs. My mother passed away at 43. And I went through a divorce. As bad as it was, I recall a, a bulletin that Dr. Harry Robert, right over here, brought back from First Baptist Church in Dallas. He's a Methodist. <laughs> Never did figure out what you were doing there. Uh, and on the front cover, it said, what appears to be the end may simply be a new beginning. And young folks, you need to remember that. What appears to be the end may simply be a new beginning. Well, after living alone as a bachelor for five years, and, uh, Chad's friends thought it was a great fraternity house. <laughs> I met dated for five years uh, and married a very special lady, my wife, Catherine, who had two very young children, seven and five. And I'm thinking, this could definitely be life-changing. <laughs> two grown kids and seven and five. Well, that seven-year-old girl is getting ready to have a baby our sixth grand, fifth grandchild, any day now. My, uh, my third defining moment. Well, it truly was an answer to prayer, a new beginning. And while my journey seemed to be back on course and rolling down the road, Without interruption, I'm totally convinced that God was preparing me for my greatest crossroads. Uh, my journey was getting ready to become very complicated. Uh, you might uh, say I was preparing to run off the road. And for years, I've been a runner. Coach, I was pretty proud of myself. I ran a Marathon, 1989. I bet you didn't know that. 
didn't run fast. But really. <laughs> In September 2005, I began to notice that it took me longer to run the same distance. And I had a noticeable flopping sound in my feet, and I had a significant weight loss that I didn't understand since I wasn't on a diet. And after many uh, tests, I was referred to Dr. Renicki at UAMS, and a tremendous asset for our state. Uh, and after going to see Dr. Renicki, after 90 days of intense testing, I was initially diagnosed in December, December 7, 2005, with motor neuron disease. That was my birthday. I told Dr. Renicki, don't ever examine me on my birthday again. <laughs> but this is an umbrella description for many neurological disorders. And some are more serious than, than others. Next 90 days, we finally diagnosed it with ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig disease. Now, Lou Gehrig, most of you remember, great player, New York Yankees, and uh, you remember in his great speech, he said, I just caught some bad luck. Well, what a great statement. That's exactly what I hear from most of my ALS friends. You know, it could not have been a worse diagnosis. Disease is rare uh, with only about 20,000 people in the U.S. having it, 5,000 new added each year, 5,000 uh, finished their, their journey. Uh, obviously, the, the disease is fatal, debilitating, and uh, there is no, no cure. But I'm here to tell you that I've had, I've made numerous friends that are ALS patients. Some still on their journey, and some have completed it. But you won't find anybody with a better attitude still trying to do all they can do to help others than an ALS patient. Well, as you might expect, lots of fear, lots of anxiety, and disbelief, and all the things that, that go with that. But through our faith and the power of prayer and tremendous support of friends, we pulled that old, that old car uh, out of the ditch. I like to say, kind of, Catherine came out first and then pulled me out by my hair. But we started on our journey again. And uh, through all of this, I, I began to get a sense of peace that truly remains with me today. As my journey continues, I'm going to keep working, volunteering, uh, playing with my grandkids and telling my story of faith, and power of prayer, and trust in the Lord. Uh, you know, God's given me more than I deserve and certainly more than <laughs> my fair share of blessings and successes and even thrills in, in life. Football, basketball, most of the time, not always. <laughs> but having said that, the greatest thrill of them all has been when your grandchildren and put their arms around your neck and say, I love you, Papa. Well, you know, that'll help get your priorities in order real quick. And mine are, and they will continue to, to be there uh, until there are no more crossroads. So I ask myself sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit down, is this my final crossroad? And I doubt it is my answer. And I believe that you know, God has many things left for me to do. And I know that there are some tremendous challenges in front of my family and, and me, but because we turned it over to the Lord and left it there, I, I'm convinced that, you know, we'll be up to the challenge. 
So Isaiah 41 10 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you up in my victorious right, right hand. God did not say that he would make my disease go away, but he can. One of the greatest promises is that we don't have to face our fears alone. You know, we all have our challenges. I mean, mine is simply a bit more definitive, and a lot of that has to do with the visibility of my position. I believe that I'll be living 10 years from now. I told Dr. Renicki, it's up to her. <laughs> <laughs> and that I, I wanted to be around for the national championship. And after that surgery, she came over and said, I did my part. The rest is up to Coach Petrina. <laughs> so and I choose to get up every morning. Catherine is going to frown at this with a positive attitude. Occasionally, maybe not. Except, of course, when the razor knife get beat. Skip. But when I have a down moment, and I do, you know, I'm, I'm simply reminded uh, of the promises from the cross, and I, I think in terms of my friend Bill Clark and Paul Ells, and I'm, I'm just reminded that every day is a good day, and uh, every day we ought to think about what we can do to help others. And when I think of these young men and women going to this school, and that is what is top of mind to them. What more could you ask for? So, uh, we need to all remember to be thankful. Live every day to its fullest. And hug our family. And don't hesitate to use the love word. I tell my family every day I love them. Uh, and always remember that God has prepared us for our journey. And now we need to do all we can do to help others to also be prepared. Skip, I know I'm not leaving time for Q&A, but that's a great thing. But I don't like answering. Almost three. Let me leave with this story. One night I'd, I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord and many scenes from my life Last across the sky, and in each scene, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets, and others there was just simply one. It bothered me because I noticed that during the low points of my life, when I was suffering from anguish and sorrow or defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, you promised me that if I followed you, you would walk with me always, but I have noticed that during most of the trying periods there was, of my life, there was only one set of footprints. And why, when I needed you most, you have not been there for me? Well, the Lord replied, the times when you have seen only one set of footprints in the sand is when I carried you. So as I look back on my life, I realized that during my darkest moments, there was a single set of footprints, and the Lord had me on his shoulders, and I can tell you, I was very heavy. You know, he's there for me, and he's going to be there for you and these young folks as they continue to make a difference in our world. My journey remains uncertain but my ultimate destination is guaranteed. So to the students, I leave you with this challenge. Do all you can do to enjoy every minute of your life. Live out your dreams. Go the extra mile to help others who are in need. 
and take each of life's lessons that you will have on your journey and use them when you come to your crossroads in life. And to the rest of the audience that might be a little older, I leave you with this challenge. Reflect on your life lessons already learned. Be thankful for all your blessings and prepare yourself to make a difference in the lives of others. There's no greater sense of gratification than to help others in need. To show strength in times of crisis and to lead by example in bad times as well as good. Thank you very much. Uh, agreed to take a couple of questions. <laughs> and let me just say, uh, time by starting, number one, when we had that 15-point lead last night, <laughs> I want you to know that, that I, I knew you'd be in a good mood today. <laughs> and when I found out we lost by two, I thought you might cancel. <laughs> I'm glad you... <laughs> All right, let's... Uh, let's uh, uh, anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. In 1964, your team was behind, and you had two bootlegs for touchdowns. Tell us, was that a defining moment? Well, it really wasn't because we lost 36 to 14. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Anyone have anything they'd like to say? Well, let's give a round of applause. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Sugg. I would just like to recognize one of God's true children, Catherine May. Stand up, Catherine. I know all of you, or some of you, want to come visit with Tommy. Let's give another round of applause to a great American Tommy Knight.